Hello, Saber. Uh, hello, hello. I'm here today to talk about the new book, Message Not Received. I've got some prizes, some free books, some t-shirts. Go for about 45 minutes, and then I'll take some questions. I've written a bunch of books. This is number seven, Message Not Received, Why Business Communication is Broken and How to Fix It. The previous books have been about big data, about platforms, about IT projects. I've been called a technology expert. I don't love the term, but as someone who used to spend a lot of time consulting, it's a lot better than what I have been called in a professional setting. And I also do some public speaking. And as I put this talk together, I thought that it was really important for me to start off by saying what I am not. Because if you're talking about language, it's very personal. I have a friend who's a strict Android guy. I'm an iOS guy. We don't see eye to eye on things. I can't tell him he's wrong, but he is. So if I'm going to be talking about language, it's important for me to explain a little bit about my own communication journey. And first up, I am not omniscient. I don't know everything about language or communication, about business or technology, but I like to think I know at least a little bit. I'm also not the world's best communicator, although I have dramatically improved my communication skills over the years. When I was in my mid-20s, it was actually, for me, a significant professional liability. Sometimes I had the right answer, but I couldn't communicate it pretty well. I would confuse people with my words, or the choice of words, I should say. And even today, I don't bat a thousand. Sometimes people don't understand me. Sometimes I don't understand other people. But I like to think I've got a pretty good batting average. And then finally, I am not the arbiter of what is or what is not jargon. There's no big list in the book. I have my pet peeves. When I hear people talk about strategic alignments and synergies, I kind of roll my eyes but I can't say that something is definitively jargon or not. And here I always go back to the very famous quote from 1964, Justice Potter Stewart was ruling on a Supreme Court case on the definition of pornography. Bet you didn't think I was going there this soon. <laughs> and when asked for a definition, he famously said, I don't know, but I know it when I see it. And I feel like that's the same thing with jargon. So you know it when you see it. It isn't necessarily one word, but when you read a paragraph or li listen to a sentence ripe with a bunch of mumbo jumbo, you kind of know what it is. And for two decades now, I've worked in professional settings and I've seen the effects of bad business communication. My first book is called Why New Systems Fail. It's about dysfunctional IT projects, many of which hinged upon really bad communication uh, with clients, with partners, with consultants, with software vendors. So I've seen it firsthand, and as I thought about book number seven, having written a couple about data, big data, data visualization, I decided to go on a mission to simplify business communication. And that's what I'll talk about today. Now, I've already quoted Justice Potter Stewart. I'm also going to throw a little Seinfeld at you. Told you. And he famously said, we never should have put a man on the moon. Because now, we can say we could put a man on the moon, but we can't insert name of simple task. So we can put a man on the moon, but we can't communicate well at work. And I feel like this is a really big problem, but fortunately, the solution is within our reach. And I'll talk today about how we can communicate better at work, and it isn't that hard. If I can do it better, then I fail to see why anyone else can't do it as well. So I've already thrown out a couple quotes. Here's one more that's actually on the jacket of the book. Does anyone know who said this one? We got some book prizes. It's a bit obscure. This is the Jeopardy $1,000, $2,000 question. This is a tough one. Give him a book, George Bernard Shaw. Very nicely done. <laughs> George Bernard Shaw, the Irish playwright and co-founder of the London School of Economics. I'll sign it later. <laughs> Famously said, the biggest communication, a big problem, biggest problem in communication is the illusion that's taken place. And that, to me, is really a nice summary we don't communicate with the intent of confusing people. We think that when we send an email or we give a talk, or we think that our message is being received, but often it's not. This is a very natural human belief, right? Yet, if this were the case, as I'll talk about in a bit, business communication wouldn't be so broken. Next book giveaway, this one is much less obscure. Who are these guys? Give it to Walter and Jesse. So business community, my favorite TV show. Um, if you catch me later, we can talk about Better Call Saul, which I think is excellent. Yeah. So why is business communication broken? In a nutshell, I'd argue that there are two problems. Number one, we send way too much email. And I'm going to tell you some stories in a bit and show you some data on just how much email we send and receive every day. 
And number two, we use way too much jargon and generally confusing language. Now, I'm a data guy. That hasn't changed. And I want to collect a little data right now. And it's interesting. Um, we often don't think about how many emails we get in a day. And if I asked you that, you'd probably have to think about it because I don't know too many people who count. But I'd like everyone to stand up for a moment. And I want you to think about how many unread messages right now are in your inbox. Okay? That one you might know. Go ahead and have a seat if it's 25 or fewer. Wow. Okay, for those of you standing, 50 or fewer, have a seat. Uh-oh. Those of you standing, Corey, you're on a different planet. <laughs> More than 100? If it's under 100, sit down. Okay. Everyone can have a seat. Now, I'm assuming from those of you who sat down early on when I mentioned under 25 that you're probably checking email fairly frequently through the day. It's not like we do this once or twice a day. I know I don't. I'm trying to get to a point at which I'm checking email three times a day, but I'm not there yet. I'm trying to promote a book. I've hired a PR firm. She gets back to me quickly. I want to respond. So I'm not where I want to be yet. But the problem really isn't email when you think about it. In my opinion, the problem is how we use it. Now, email isn't necessarily a bad thing. In fact, I'd argue that email actually serves a vital business purpose. I was around in 1992, and I remember in college getting my first email, and it absolutely blew my mind. I used to send letters to my friends. We used to photocopy them and just send out chain letters. That's how we kept in touch with each other. And this begs the question, why has email become, in many, if not most organizations, the default means of communicating? And there are a bunch of reasons. First, ubiquity. When was the last time that anyone gave you a business card that did not include an email address? I spoke last week in Seattle, and actually one guy raised his hand. It happened because the guy was anti-email, so I uh, <laughs> sold that. <laughs> but for the most part, everyone has email, and that has tremendous power. That has tremendous value. If only the left side of the room could email me and not the right side, well, then it has a limited utility, right? But if everyone can email me and I can email you, it's tremendously powerful. They call it a network effect. Right? So everyone has email. It's also incredibly convenient. Right? Does anyone remember the days in which you actually had to go into a proper office, sit down at a proper computer, or if you're at home, log in with your laptop through a virtual private network or VPN? We don't have to do that anymore. Why? It's very convenient for us if we're online. Right? I've got five minutes on uh, at Target or at Starbucks, or I, I went to lunch earlier with some people, and people were checking their email, I'm sure. So it's become incredibly convenient. It's also incredibly cheap. I studied economics at Carnegie Mellon, and I often think that if we tried to apply a little bit of economics to it, we might actually solve the problem. Not $10 tax per email, but how about a penny? And at the end of the month, if you're paid monthly, you had a $20 deduction. Why is this? You sent 2,000 emails. Just enough to make you think. But in fact, there's no cost. This is why spam is so hard, right? If spammers had to pay a penny to spam you, eventually they'd stop. But email is basically free. Email is also very fast. Yes, there are instances in which things get delayed for some reason, but email's been around now for a long time. And it's not the equivalent of real-time communication. I'm going to talk about that in a bit. But for the most part, email gets there fairly quickly. Does everyone here want to use Outlook, Microsoft Shops, so or what do you hit F5 or F9? I'm a Mac guy now, but you can basically check your email very quickly. If it took 10 minutes to reach you, I guarantee people would be dialing up the fax machines. It's also incredibly reliable. I don't have any data on this, but I would imagine that over 99.99% .99 of emails get to the right person. There are glitches, but it's incredibly reliable. One of those glitches, true story, my friend Brian asked me if I had received some of his emails. And I said, no, I hadn't. Again, I'm not anti-email, I'm just anti-inefficiency. And I, he has said, you have irked the email gods with your new book. They are <laughs> messing with you. It turns out that some of my email was being incorrectly filed as spam. But again, that's the exception that proves the rule. Most of the time when we send an email, the other person receives it. Whether that person reads it, understands it, totally different subject. But we don't have to worry about emails vanishing into the ether. 
It's also incredibly secure. I know what some of you are thinking. What about the Sony hack? Again, that's the exception that proves the rule. Most of the time, your email is secure. Of course, we've all hit reply all, right? When we meant to reply to one person, it's happened to everyone, including myself. But for the most part, it is a very secure medium. And perhaps best of all, and here's a 50 cent word, it is asynchronous, which is just a fancy way of saying that if I want to send Corey a note at 2 in the morning when I was up, and I was up this morning at 2 o'clock my time, I'm not waking him up. Corey can answer it if and when he chooses. If it's more convenient for him in the afternoon or when normal people are awake, then he can do that. Email would be much less useful if you could only use it at the same time, like the telephone, right? Forget voicemail for a moment. I have to get you on the phone. You could be busy, you could be in a meeting, you could be away from your desk, whatever. Email's not like that. You just throw it over to someone, that person gets it when they get it. So email has become the default means of communication. It is very useful, but we've gone way, way, way too far with it. Anyone here a Dilbert fan? Here's one of my favorites. So I argue that the problem is not email. The problem is how we use it. Now for the next one, I'm going to give away a t-shirt. Now I've got men's and women's. Right. Who's this guy? Not just the movie, but the name. Very good. Here's a t-shirt. Uh, you can pass around. Ted Knight from Caddyshack. He throws his club into a house and knocks somebody out because he sliced his golf ball. And I golf and I slice all the time. And it's very easy for me to blame my club. Club didn't swing itself. I did. So we spend a great deal of time sending and receiving email, but people don't realize how much. So I did some research for the book and asked the question, what percentage of time does the average knowledge worker spend sending and responding to emails? For a free book, anyone with a guess? 70, wow, no. I heard a 30, who said 30? Okay, yeah, hook him up with the book. It's actually 28, but we'll take that. Were you the, one of the people standing up earlier after said 100? You might know people who spend 70% of their time. We definitely gotta get you a book somehow. 28% of your day sending and receiving email. That's an astonishing number. Three to four hours a day, every day, sending and receiving email. I'm a data guy, I like math, let's do some. You're not winning a book for this one, this is way too easy. Although you don't watch The Simpsons. How do you not like Homer? This equation is not going to make any sense to you, but I'm going to explain it. Let's say that you receive 150 emails a day. And you spend just one minute, 60 seconds on each email. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. Well, guess what? You're at two and a half hours a day, and if you work eight to 10 hours a day, there you are at your 28 to 30%. Now, let's say that you are comfortable with that, right? It's the default means of communicating. You don't write letters, who here watches Mad Men? Right, inter-office memos with those envelopes, right? We don't do that anymore. That's just the way that people communicate. What's wrong with spending two and a half hours a day on email? Okay, it's a fair question. But what if I told you that number is only increasing? If you think that you're overwhelmed now, here's some more data for you. You only get 100 emails a day. If that's growing at a rate of 15% a year, then by 2020, you will receive 200 emails in a day. Unless you can figure out how to cram more hours in a day, something has to give. This led Nick Bilton to say the following things. Nick Bilton is the author of Hatching Twitter, an excellent book about Twitter, very dysfunctional culture. I'll talk about Twitter more in a minute. But he thinks that is the single most invasive form of communication yet devised. He also writes for the New York Times. Smart cookie. You might be thinking, so what? It's invasive. We spend a lot of time doing it, right? What does it mean for the bottom line? Funny you should ask. In the book, I argue that if you rely on email so much, it's actually bad business. And I'm gonna tell you some stories, and I'm gonna throw out some numbers. And again, this one is way too easy. But it costs US businesses about 
one trillion dollars a year. Now, again, that's such a big number. What's the context? Well, Uber recently was valued at $40 billion, so that's 25 Ubers. The US gross domestic product in 2012 was $15.4 trillion, so it's about a six or 7% increase in productivity or decrease in savings if you start adopting more collaborative tools. Now, this isn't my number. I didn't do the research. I just did some independent Googling. And this is the number that McKinsey came up with. They did a study, and if we embrace these new collaborative tools, in other words, not email, we actually can save this amount of money. Right? Now, again, these are very big numbers. Let's make it a little bit more specific. Hopefully you'll get this one. I gave this talk about three weeks ago, and no one got the following. This is, this is bookworthy. What movie is this? Close, close. It's Heat. Pacino and De Niro are on screen together. These two storied actors, arguably two of the greatest actors in American history, for the first time are on, state, on the screen together. Yeah, they were both in Godfather 2, but Pacino was never on the same screen with De Niro. And I gave this talk at a large organization, and before the talk, we were discussing what I would talk about. And they told me the story about how for two years, this organization struggled with a thorny data problem. Now, I've worked on many thorny data problems. I'm a data guy. But they were telling me how they were trying to solve the problem. And they were emailing each other back and forth. Now, making matters worse, the company was in San Francisco, and the other team was in England. Now, yes, you both speak English, but the Queen's English isn't the same as how they talk in San Francisco. And there's a time difference. And remember, email is asynchronous. So I might send you something on a Thursday, and they don't get it in England until Monday. Right? And by that time, what are you talking about? They finally got these people together. And after two years of emailing back and forth, they actually sat down and said, oh, this is the problem. I thought you meant something else. They solved it very quickly. Again, Seinfeld's quote, we can put a man on the moon, but it's going to take two years to solve a data problem. So there's this need for in-person communication. Yet a lot of us avoid it. Right? Why do we insist upon email? And there are a lot of reasons for that. Right? We can't seem to get off the email train. At a high level, the answer is because of people factors. Right? The answer is not technological. At lunch, we were talking about how 15 years ago when I worked in the enterprise, there weren't the same types of tools that I'm going to talk about in a bit. You could justify long email chains and ignoring these collaborative tools more because there really weren't that many better options. Yes, there were nascent knowledge bases and intranets, but compared to today, the tools you have like Atlassian with HipChat or Slack or Yammer or Jive or Trello, they're incredibly powerful. And they're incredibly affordable. We live in an era of cloud computing, of open source software, of software as a service. You can try these tools for a month, and if you don't like them, go away. It wasn't like that 15 years ago. This is not 1998. There are very powerful tools that I thought we had killed the audio. But this is the HipChat demo from Atlassian. And you can create these effectively enterprise social networks. It's a lot like Facebook. Right? And you can search with something like a hashtag. You could tag someone with the at symbol. The search is much better. This, uh, if you recognize the names here, this is from the American version of The Office. Right? I'm a fan of the English version myself, but it's the same point. The tools are much more powerful, much more affordable. The search, for example, is much better. You don't have the information living in somebody's inbox. And if that employee isn't around, then I guess you have to hack it or maybe call IT. So I started wondering about the reasons we couldn't get off the email train. And there are a lot of them, and most of them have to deal with us. Number one, we're just used to it. If you send only 100 emails a day, then that's 500 a week. And if you do that for 48 weeks a year, let's say you get four weeks vacation, whether or not you check email and send them on vacation is a separate discussion. That's about 24,000 times a year. If you do something 24,000 times a year, you're going to get pretty good at it. You're going to get used to it. Right? Email is also very official. This is the way that companies announce things, right? a new hire, a new product launch. Right? This is the way they use 
communication tools internally. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the cover your ass nature of email, right? We've all had this happen. And let's say that Ashley and I go to lunch and I report to Ashley and I say, this, this hire is a mistake. We shouldn't be going with this person. I've got all these concerns, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you, and I finish our lunch. Six months later, it's been known to happen, but I was right. Where's the proof? Yeah, Ashley, remember that conversation we had? No, or I remember it differently, or you, I won't say got hit by a bus, let's say you won the lottery and you don't work here anymore, right? So there's a way of protecting ourselves, and we've all done it, right? We've all played email war with people, and after three or four, someone copies a vice president, right? It's all CYA, right? It's also ubiquitous. There is no friction. In the book, I write about a woman by the name of Justine Sacco. Does anyone remember what happened to her about a year and a half ago? South Africa, for those of you who don't know, you already got a book. <laughs> I anoint her the queen of the dumb tweet. Now, if you're 12 years old and you tweet something that's sexist or racist, I'm not saying it's right, but you're 12 years old, you don't know any better. But if you're a 35-year-old professional woman who is a vice president of public relations for a bunch <laughs> of media companies, you probably don't want to tweet the following. Going to Africa, hope I don't get AIDS, just kidding, I'm white. That went viral. Has Justine landed yet? Was trending on Twitter. Her plane didn't have Wi-Fi, so by the time she landed, she had no idea what was going on. My point is, there was no friction, right? So she could tweet any stupid thing that came into her head, and she was subsequently uh, let go. Ironically, she just got another job. Um, I guess she learned her lesson. So my point is that email is everywhere. Right, because of these things, it's so convenient. It's very easy for us to rattle off an email. It would be a lot different if we had to go into an office, if we had to log into a virtual private network from our houses. It's very easy, it's, very, it's almost too easy, I think. In many cases, there's fear of personal interaction. We've all seen this with the squirrely IT people. Any Office Space fans here, Milton, Red Stapler? We fear having that discussion, right? We don't want to engage in a conversation that may make us say things we don't want to say, right? With email, we can sit back and refine it, make sure we get the tone right, right? I know that we, I could rattle off stats about people blowing through emails in 20 or 30 seconds. I don't know about you, but I've spent on certain emails with political consequences in my consulting career easily an hour. Right? It was a treatise. In fact, I've probably written another seven books just through emails in my career before I decided to write real ones. <laughs> There's also, um, I think, what my friend Scott Birkin calls the cult of busy, right? We secretly complain about email, right? oh, I'm so busy, but we love it, right? We're important, we're needed. And you think about some of our friends who maybe don't have jobs, right, and they're down in their luck, if you're given the choice between being constantly bombarded and you have to feel important and a little overwhelmed and stressed versus being basically irrelevant, I would argue most people would opt for that one. All right, so we complain about it, but secretly we like it. And this isn't just me, this is actually um, science. We get a shot of dopamine when we get an email, when we get a text message, there's that possibility. Even though we secretly complain about it, we actually like it. And in many cases, there are cultural norms. Right? I have irked many people in my day because I said, well, there's a better way of doing this. Right? Have you thought about this tool or doing it this particular way? So that's not the way we do it here. Right? Now, that's a lot different in startups. Austin, from what I understand, has a relatively robust startup scene. Vegas does as well. It's not Silicon Valley, but no, nothing really is. And when I talk to people who run startups, a lot of them will use these collaborative tools. Why? They don't have the cultural baggage. They don't have the IT legacy systems. You don't have the mentality right, that requires email. Of course you use a more collaborative tool, but it's easier at a company that's what I would call a greenfield site versus one that's been more mature, more of a brownfield site. Sometimes we're not aware that there are better tools that are out there. I was at a conference in 2013 in Manhattan with a bunch of other thought leaders, a term that I don't love, but again, I've been called a lot worse, so I'll take what I can get. And a fairly prominent woman had said, oh, employees are dying to be more productive, but the tools aren't there. I just said, what, are you kidding me? What do you mean the tools aren't there? Tools are everywhere. There's a, a very big table in the book on tools that just I've tried out, and I'm a one-person shop. So this notion that the tools are there or not there is just completely misplaced. More likely, though, it's just laziness, right? 
We don't want to learn a new tool. We send 24,000 emails a year, right? We know how it works. Yeah, it has limitations. And even if we recognize the problem, who has time to learn a new tool, even if those tools actually look a lot like social networks that a lot of us spend a lot of time on. And in many instances, and I've seen this quite a bit, we like to blame IT. This is the chicken and egg question, right? IT doesn't give us what we need. Hold aside the thought that we live in an era of bring your own device, right? We can use tools whether or not IT sanctions them or not, right? I'm sure most, most of you are on something like Snapchat or IT may block Facebook through WebSense, but if you're on your own LTE or 3G network, which AT&T, Verizon, whatever, it doesn't really matter. I've been a part of a lot of software demos in my day, and invariably one of the first questions people ask is, can I get this into Excel? Now, I have nothing against Excel. Excel is really useful. I used to spend probably 1,000 hours a year in it. I got to be really good at it. But you can understand if IT is dealing with security threats, hardware upgrades, et cetera, et cetera, why some of the people wouldn't want to spend limited time and resources giving you tools that you're just going to ignore. So a lot of reasons we can't get off the email train. And people forget that email doesn't always work. In fact, sometimes people who know each other really well don't communicate particularly well through email. You get a book and a shirt if you get this one. Does anyone know who these guys are? Very obscure. One of my all-time favorite bands. This is Marillion. They're based in the UK. They've released 19 studio albums over a career that has spanned more than three decades. They've played thousands of shows together. Um, really great music. I'm, I'm a big fan of actually um, interviewed a bunch of them for Huffington Post. Marillion, M-A-R-I-L-L-I-O-N. I actually dedicate, funny story, I dedicate the book to Marillion. And I had a couple of friends go up to me and go, I didn't know you were serious about someone. Who's this Marillion woman? <laughs> it's a band. So I interview a bunch of the guys for Huffington Post. And recently I interviewed Mark Kelly, who's the band's um, keyboardist. And I was ready to ask him about the band, what they were doing, new album, et cetera, et cetera. He said, stop. I saw you have a new book out. We could talk about me. That's cool. He said, my wife runs, his wife, runs a PR firm over in England. And she said that her clients are always bombarding her with emails. So he wanted to talk about my book. I said, oh, basically, we send too much email. We, send it, uh, we use too much jargon. And he goes, it's funny you mention that because the drummer, Ian Mosley, the guy on the other side of him, got into a bit of a kerfuffle with the band. And he had sent an email that rubbed everyone the wrong way. So they, they, eventually they got him on the phone. They said, hey, Ian, what's going on? You seem really upset. He goes, not at all. So think about it. A band that's been together for over 30 years, played more than you know, two or 3,000 shows together, can have these massive understandings over email. What does that say for a company with 300 or 3,000? And what if those employees are new? They don't know each other that well. They haven't gone to each other's weddings. Right? But that's just a single story. right? Again, I'm a data guy. Let's look at a study from 2006. A couple of researchers looked at the efficacy of communication. Right? And they asked people, do you think you're being clear with others? Right? Simple question, right? But they looked at it in an interesting way. They split being clear in person speaking versus email. Now, the results were interesting. 80% of the people thought that they were being clear when they were sending their message. Right. I actually think that's kind of low. I don't meet one in five people who will cop to not being clear. You know, I'm not clear. No one knows what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> but whatever. That, that was their number. Right. Listeners were able to pick up on sarcasm and humor 75% of the time. OK, that's reasonable, right? Three times in four, not great. But for email, that number dropped. Only about half the time were people able to pick up on the tone. And tone is very important. That's not the worst part of the study, though, in my opinion. This is one of the reasons I call the book Message Not Received. Most of the people sending the message didn't have any idea that they weren't making themselves clear. Go back to George Bernard Shaw's quote. How the hell did you get that? That was very impressive. <laughs> George Bernard Shaw. So that's not the worst part. People didn't even understand they were making themselves unclear. The larger point here is that text-based communication provides this illusion of clarity, right? But we're actually stripping out a lot of the nonverbal cues, right? 
someone's tone of voice, someone's facial expressions, hand gestures. These things are important when it comes to communicating. But remember, email is asynchronous, right? I didn't put it in here because of some profanity, but if you get a chance, Google Key and Peel text messaging. There's a great skit. It's a sketch comedy show. And I'll leave out the profanity, but make a long story short, they're texting each other, and one guy thinks it's very playful, and another guy's getting increasingly upset, dropping F-bombs. So there's this illusion of clarity around text-based communication. But what are the other, oh, that's weird. Why do we have an N in there? Interesting. What are the other effects of excessive email? How about it makes us stupid? Here's some more statistics. If you miss a night's sleep, your IQ drops by about 10 points. I probably dropped about eight, because I only slept about three hours last night, long story. What's the context there? That number probably doesn't mean much to you. It might be intuitive, because if you've ever pulled an all-nighter the next day, you are feeling a bit sloggy. If you smoke pot, your IQ only drops by four points. For a t-shirt, who is this guy? Who said it? OK. Uh, yeah. Love the dude. I actually had friend of, uh, dinner last night with a friend of mine, and he didn't know I was a big fan, but he had on a big dude shirt. And went to see that. Why even talk? So how have you been? Let's talk about the movie. Great movie. I haven't seen it. All right. So if you show up to work high, your IQ drops by four points. Constantly checking email, 10 points. So you're better off toking at work than you are constantly checking your email. <laughs> People think, oh, I'm multitasking. No, you're not. Multitasking is nonsense. You're multi-changing. You can't do two things at the same time. There's a reason that driving while texting is four times more dangerous than driving while drunk. When you're driving while drunk, you're actually trying to focus. <laughs> you're texting. <laughs> so what are the other effects of emailing too much? We become confused and overwhelmed. It's very natural for that to happen. Um, I, interestingly enough, was in Austin last night, and when I called... Ashley said, what time should I be there? And I, I typed in the directions and realized I was 260 miles away. <laughs> Whoops. That's why I didn't sleep last night, and I'm here now. So when you're dealing with a lot of email, it's easy to get things confused. And it happens to everyone, myself included. Like I said, I'm not a perfect communicator. Case in point, uh, missed my call last night. We make it nearly impossible to find key information. Um, I remember email search back in the mid-1990s. It was terrible. It has certainly gotten better, but I guarantee that everyone here has had this happen. You can't find an email. And you're searching by date. You're searching by name. You're searching by keywords, negative keywords, folders, filters, da, 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 and you can't find that email. It's happened to everyone. Think about this. Google indexes around 30 trillion web pages last time I checked. Mind-boggling number, 30 trillion. And you can pretty much find what you want very quickly. And I'm going to talk about some statistics on Google in a bit. I don't care how much email you get. You're nowhere near 30 trillion. But often, we can't find what we need in our inboxes. And that's the point. They're in an individual inbox. They're not in a community environment. They're not in a collaborative tool. That doesn't mean that if I'm having a performance discussion with someone, I want everyone to see it. Right? But Stuart Brand said in 1972, information wants to be free. Good point, right? A lot of information should be shared, not necessarily with the public at large, not even maybe with your colleagues, but why does all this information, valuable information, need to sit within an individual's inbox? We also tend to irritate customers and partners. Has anyone here heard of constant contact? I'd be shocked if you haven't, if at one point you haven't received an email at the bottom brought to you by constant contact, right? It's a marketing company. And Constant Contact did some research, and I cite it in the book, in which the, the single biggest reason that people unsubscribe from email lists is that they get too much email. They're overwhelmed. I know I'll sign up for a company's product or service. I give them my email address. I get to kick the tires on it. You send me seven emails in seven days, it's too much. We also lose focus. This is some more interesting data. In 2000, the average American attention span was 13 seconds. That means nothing to you because I have given you no context. I'm about to give you some context. That number now has dropped to eight. OK, makes sense, right? We now are trailing goldfish. The average goldfish 
has an attention span of nine seconds, and this data comes from the National Center for Biotolo Biotechnology Information. We can't pay attention for as long as goldfish can. So think about that next time you're constantly juggling back and forth with email. Is it any surprise that things fall between the cracks? So hopefully I've made the case that we use email too much, that there are a lot of problems with email. Again, I'm not against email, but there are better tools for it. And at the end of this talk, I'm going to go over a few of my rules for email. Um, for example, if I were king, I would ban urgent emails. If it's really urgent, you should call up. When I realized that I was 221 miles away last night at 6 o'clock, I didn't send Ashley an email. I called up and said, I think I screwed up. <laughs> Email's only half the problem, though. The other problem with business communication, the way I see it, is jargon. And here's where I get to tee off on some pretty horrendous uses of the English language. Um, I think that the following quote ought to be in everyone's office or cubicle in corporate America. No less authority than Einstein stressed the merits of simplicity. And people say, well, well, that's all fine and dandy for something, but I work on really important technology stuff. Okay. I had lunch about a year ago now with a buddy of mine. And I'm a pretty technical guy. I am a geek. My friend just dances circles around me. Acronym this, big data that. So I'm having lunch with my friend and his son. And his son Jacob's 16 years old. And he's talking about big data. And you can imagine what Jacob was doing. Or I should say, you should imagine where Jacob was looking. And I stopped about 10 minutes in. So Jacob, do you understand what we're talking about? I said, what do you think? Well, we're talking about big data. Said, OK, wonderful. Do you use Facebook? He goes, yeah. What about Twitter? OK, you watch videos on YouTube? Yeah. Well, that generates a lot of information, right? Yeah. Well, imagine if you were trying to market to people and you knew which people liked a particular video or a particular phase on Facebook, page on Facebook. Wouldn't that be valuable? He goes, yeah. Of course there's more to it, right? But you don't talk to a 16-year-old about fault tolerance and parallel processing and unstructured data and petabytes because that's not going to register with that person in all likelihood. So you can explain just about anything simply. Of course there's more there. Yet jargon permeates the business world. It always has. But I think it's gotten worse, and I'm going to explain why in a little while. Here are just some of the uh, usual suspects of jargon. Like I said, I can't tell you there's a definitive list, but when I see price point, that one just drives me crazy. Why is it price point? Why isn't it just price? <laughs> All right, T-shirt to whoever gets this one. What vision statement, which company? Color should give it away a little bit. Twitter. Can I throw this? Oops, sorry. This was Twitter's vision statement on November 12th, 2014. It is an utter mess. 220 characters of pure nonsense. Does anyone know the maximum number of characters for a tweet? 140. They couldn't even fit this into one tweet. And Twitter's current CEO, Dick Costolo, has also confused Wall Street talking about his theory of eccentric circles. He actually meant concentric. Everyone makes a mistake, but he said it twice. Now, if your company is valued at, last time I checked, $30 billion, and your multiple is off the charts insane, it behooves you to be reasonably clear with people. <laughs> Dennis Berman from Wall Street Journal, he's the business editor, threw out this snarky tweet in response to the uh, mission statement from Twitter. 35 words, 62 syllables, four clauses, and two grammatical errors. Why can't you be clear about what your company is doing, especially when your whole product is based on brevity and wit? But it isn't just Twitter. Here's a press release from a software vendor that I actually cite in the book. And this is a stunning bouillabaisse of tech jargon. And as I mentioned, a couple of my books are about big data. So I know what a lot of these things are, but when you put them together in one sentence with 61 words and 380 characters, I defy you to explain what this means. True story, I was at a conference last year in Las Vegas, and I saw a guy from CSC at one of the booths. You know where this is going. 
So I walked up to him and said, tell me about BDPAAS. And he was really excited because someone had heard of it. And, well, because of the cloud and da 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 you guys have any customers? He didn't like that question. And he equivocated. Well, it depends on what you mean by customer. Is anyone paying you to use it? Long story short, no. Now, there could be a lot of reasons for that, but if this is your marketing message, if this is your first sentence, does it make you want to know more, or are you going to click away? My first book, Why New Systems Fail, is about IT projects that have broken bad. And those projects essentially broke down into two categories. A, customer relationship management, CRM, and B, ERP, or enterprise relationship planning, resource planning, excuse me. Back office stuff, HR, payroll, supply chain, financials. Those projects had a 60% failure rate. And people knew exactly what they were buying. Yeah, we got to pay our employees. We want to track our supply chain. And three times out of five, they either went over budget, missed their deadline, didn't give users the functionality they expected, or all four. What are your odds that you're going to be successful when you don't know what you're buying? Probably not very good. Let's do a book on the next one. What movie? Cool Hand Luke, here we go, get a book. How many books do we have left, by the way, two? One more, okay. I still have a t-shirt left and one more book. Cool Hand Luke, one of my favorites. Paul Newman, Failure to Communicate. I think that movie was, what was it, 1967, thank you. Still is true today. And this isn't just big companies. Ah, uh, were we Googling? I should have stopped that. I'm dating myself here, but there's a great show on HBO back in the day called The Larry Sanders Show. Anyone ever see that one? Brilliant. And he used to do no, no flipping. Couldn't change the channel. Anyway. Here's a company endorsement from a startup. This company has it right. Next generation of cloud is about people. The WAAS technology, which is not defined, is the right middleware to blah, 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 blah. I don't know what this company does. The endorsement comes from Scott McNeely, smart guy, co-founded Sun Microsystems. Again, if I don't know what this company does, am I likely to buy it? I went to another conference in New York last year, and it was wedged between a speaking gig and seeing, I mentioned I was a Breaking Bad fan, I got to see Brian Cranston on Broadway, play Lyndon B. Johnson, Fifth Row Center. <laughs> They're turning into a movie on HBO, check it out. It was amazing, he's, he's a tour de force. Anyway. After the highlight, I go to a tech conference, and I went as a member of the media. They didn't pay me to speak. And I write for Wired and Huffington Post, and et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't really matter. And after about an hour of listening to a very senior executive spew out acronym after acronym that I didn't understand, finally I reached my breaking point. And I raised my hand and said, can you tell me what X, Y, Z, and A, B, C mean? And I got a lot of puzzled looks, right? Who the hell is this guy? And the woman answered, right? Okay, thank you. Now I know what you're talking about. About two hours later, I'm online for lunch. And I see a couple people walking up, pointing at me. I said, uh-oh. <laughs> we were looking for you. Yeah, what'd I do? You were the guy who asked those questions. Yeah. Thank you. We didn't know what they were either. I said, oh, are you with... <laughs> oh, it gets better. Oh, are you with the media as well? What outlet do you write for? No, we work for this company. Your own employees don't understand what you're saying. That's not a good idea. Now, you would think that people like myself, who are professional public speakers and writers, could actually be clear as well, right? Not necessarily. This is the author, Brian Solis. This sentence comes from his book, The End of Business as Usual. It is a 44-word absolute morass of a sentence. I don't understand what this means. And I think that, if I'm not mistaken, this is on page 70. And after I read this sentence, I shut the book and never picked it up again. Why is it so hard to be clear? I don't understand it. This brings up another one of my favorite quotes. Let's do a t-shirt on this one. Very obscure. Anyone know who said this? OK. B.F. Skinner, the American psychologist, behaviorist, author, and inventor. And it begs the question. Why is, so, why is jargon so prevalent today? Next one's for a t-shirt. You got to get this one. What movie? It is usual. I heard it from over there. 
Okay, whoever said it, I'll just throw the general direction. Okay. We should have brought the gun. One of my favorites, I actually met Gabriel Byrne, the guy in the yellow suit, about, oh gosh, now 12 years ago, nice guy. A fantastic movie, if you haven't seen it, um, guys are so great. So what are the reasons that we use so much jargon? First up, let's tee off on the management consultants. There's this erroneous belief that management is a true science that's complete nonsense. Think about science for a minute. Think about Walter White. Why could he always cook his meth? Because he was following a recipe. And if you followed the recipe, things always happen. But let's not talk about meth, right? Let's talk about water. <laughs> water always freezes at zero, zero degrees Celsius and boils at 100 degrees Celsius at one atmosphere. Always, always, always. There are no exceptions. There are no, it depends. That always happens. Is there an analog in the management world? Absolutely not. Two companies can do the same thing in the same industry and have very different results because you can't control for all the different factors. Business is not a lab. People are different. Companies are lucky. You can't tell me that there is a formula for success. Why? Because everyone would follow it and everyone can't be successful. But think about it. If I'm paying management consultants $300 an hour right, for six months and they come back with, hey, you may want to diversify. It could work. <laughs> That's why these guys invent these terms. There's a great story in the book about um, a consulting project I was on. I won't name names. But they brought me in to solve a data problem. I'm a data guy. This was 2006. And the firm that they brought in, ostensibly to work independently, very prominent, right? Everyone's heard of them in this room. And after three months, these guys couldn't make heads or tails. The consultants kept coming into the room. They kept saying, hey, how do you do this? Now, this was a huge firm. It's not like it was a boutique shop. They had people who could do it, but they weren't assigned to it. Eventually, the head management consultant comes in and said, Phil, we need to re-perform your work. And I said, what? Explain to me. Are you auditing me? Because that seems legitimate. Um, no, it's a re we're re-performing it. Don't you know what that means? I go, no. Basically, wanted to copy my homework. But it sounds a lot better if we're re-performing it, right? Even though you're just taking what I did and go, yeah, that looks good. Right? So I don't understand. Uh, why they can't be simple uh, in their language. It's probably something to do with trying to make it look more complicated than it is. Next up, I mentioned before Google and statistics. Has everyone here heard of SEO, search engine optimization? If you haven't, here's a quick primer. There are two ways to be on the top of Google, or Microsoft's Bing, or whatever you use for search. A is paid. I could pay people looking for great business books on communication, and somebody clicks then they could be directed to my book and maybe even buy it. That's good. Here's the problem. They're paying for the click, and that gets really expensive. And even though I do fine, I'm not independently wealthy. The other way is organic. So if everyone here blogs and writes about how wonderful a speaker I am and what great books I write, please do, <laughs> Google factors that in. And all of a sudden, I rise to the top of organic search. That costs me nothing. So what does that have to do with jargon? The first result on the top of Google usually accrues about 33% of all hits. So being on the top is huge. Does anyone remember Glenn Gary Gunn Ross, second prize is a set of steak knives? And it drops considerably after that. Note here the drop between number 10 and number 11. That means that people don't set their Google defaults to be on 10. 10 is the default. Most people don't change their defaults. I'll come back to that in a second. It is incredibly important to be at the top of Google. Now, if you're Kim Kardashian and people are searching millions of times a day, you could still get a lot of traffic if you're on page 5 or page 10 or maybe even page 100. But most people aren't that popular. So you can understand why these software vendors and people try to define their terms differently. Even though that sentence from CSC made no sense about big data platform as a service, I know exactly why they did it. Because if you Google data platform as a service, a, a term that I don't understand, and I've written a book about platforms, and I've written a couple books about data, you Google that, and what comes up first? A company called Cloudin. IBM bought Cloudin a couple years ago for $2 billion. So think about it. You want to not just be data platform as a service. You want to be a big data platform as a service and a next generation one to boot. So you're seeing this proliferation in jargon and buzzwords because people want to be on the top of something. I don't want to search for spreadsheet. Microsoft's going to be number one, number 1,000. right? But you'd create something different. So I'm not agreeing with it, but I kind of understand it. There's this need to sound smart and important. 
as if the bigger words mean that you're more intelligent. Uh, I gave this talk in Seattle and someone had come up to me and said, you're telling me something very different. My college professor in English said, you should always use the biggest words possible. I'm thinking to myself, my God. <laughs> Here's the rub. I have nothing against big words, polysyllabic words. But if you're throwing six or seven really big words in a row together, it confuses the hell out of people, especially when we have attention spans that are shorter than that of a goldfish. <laughs> so I don't think there's anything wrong with using the word use instead of leverage or utilize, because eventually you will get to a big word that you can't shorten. There's this fear of simplicity. I don't want to make what I'm doing seem so simple. Anyone can do it. Only I can do my job. It's the same fear that goes into why we send and receive so many emails. Again, culture and custom. Some organizations only know of jargon. Does it, did anyone ever read the book or see the movie The Smartest Guys in the Room about Enron, the company that blew up a few years ago? There's a thing called confirmation bias. We don't like to question people who are in senior positions. Organizations, with the exception of a company like Zappos, which is basically ex trying this experiment called hol holacracy, it's flat, most organizations are hierarchical, right? And you tend to take your cues from senior people. People parrot the words of the actions of VPs, of, of CEOs, right? And in an organization that's always seen that kind of jargon, you kind of stand out if you speak a little weird. There's just more stuff out there. We live in this era of big data. There is more information generated, I think, every two years than the previous years combined. There's just a lot more stuff. And change happens faster than ever. If you think that things are happening more quickly than ever, you're not alone. They've actually done a lot of research on that. And I cite some in the book. Two years ago, no one was talking about Goober. What's the new one now? Um, Meek, Meek Rat and Periscope that hit South by Southwest here in Austin. I did my book launch party in Las Vegas. And people said, oh, are you on Meek Rat yet? Everyone seems to be talking about it. And a week ago, no one had really heard of it. So things happen faster than ever. And I'd argue we are oblivious to its effects, right? What are the effects of jargon? And it's a fair question, right? All right, yeah, I don't understand what so-and-so says some of the time. What's the big deal? What are the effects of jargon? It erodes credibility and trust. In 2010, a couple of Swiss researchers conducted a study and proved something that is very intuitive, right? If you use legalese and mumbo jumbo corporate speak, you're actually viewed as less credible and less trustworthy. Here's the irony of that study. The authors recommended that people engage in greater, I'm not making this up, linguistic concreteness. That's a little ironic, right? You need to be more linguistically concrete. It confuses and overwhelms employees. Again, research from the book, employees are reaching an information tipping point they can't handle anymore. Right, I mentioned before how emails were increasing at about 15% a year. Something has to give. Most employees can't find what they need when they need it. And if you miss that one thing, that little detail about being on the wrong side of Texas, bad things can happen. It causes lost sales. Uh, I'm going to wrap up soon and take some questions. But you can't. there's a reason that that CSC representative didn't have any customer success stories. And I went to the website as well, and I didn't see any. If you're a software vendor, what's the one thing you want to do? Why do you see the logos on the front, right? If you don't have them, it means you don't um, have them. Delays and significant project failures. If you don't understand what you're trying to do and you're not clear about it, if you raise your hand and ask, even though I got a lot of weird looks at that conference, they should be thanking me. Because if I don't understand and I'm an industry expert, media guy, talking head, author, speaker dude, what are the odds that other people understand it as well? It decreases clarity. Even if you only have to ask 10% of the time, what do you mean by that? It's slowing you down. All right, I've convinced you. How do we start communicating better at work? I will preface this by saying that clear communication guarantees absolutely nothing. Does anyone here play blackjack? OK, this was me last time I played in Vegas. I try not to play that often, but I live in Las Vegas. It's the law. You have to go to a casino once a year. <laughs> what do you do here in Las Vegas, if you're me, with 11? Double down. I doubled down and I lost. I pulled a four, dealer flipped over a 10 and a five for 16. It was a lot like the movie Swingers. So clear communication guarantees absolutely nothing. But I like your chances a lot better if you're communicating well. So I'll end with some tips and then I'll take some questions. Look for co communication canaries in a coal mine. If some people don't communicate well, try to identify them from the beginning. I pitched my book tour sponsorship to a large company I won't name. And the PR firm's email address is at the front of the website. So after three emails back and forth, I said, hey, here's a link to my schedule. Here's my phone number. Let's talk. She responds. 
no time, have to do this over email. Now, I'm actually glad that happened. I broke my three email rule, and I responded with, I hope you appreciate the irony here. You represent a company that's trying to minimize email, yet you will only email me. Not very efficient. I want to know that ahead of time, because if I don't have the person's phone number, and I will pick on myself, and I'm on the wrong side of Texas, and I send you an email about what I should do, that's not a good thing. I want that person's phone number. There should be no such thing as an urgent email. Avoid the curse of knowledge. In some instances, it's not that we're trying to appear pompous or condescending. Sometimes we just forget that people don't know what we know. This happened to me when I was speaking at Cisco. I asked my contact if he wanted a galley of the book. His response, what's a galley? I wasn't trying to be pompous, I don't think. A galley is just the PDF that ultimately becomes this thing. So it happens to everyone, the curse of knowledge. We know what we know, and we forget that other people don't. Clearly define your terms. I bet you that most people in this room know what SEO is. But when I mentioned SEO, I offered, what, a 20-second definition? And I bet you that the people who may not have heard of it or weren't as familiar probably appreciated that high-level overview. It doesn't take very long to define your terms. I'm a big fan of using simpler language, saving your syllables. I don't think there's such a thing as an email conversation. Again, if only half of the time people understand you, why would you take that risk if it's something important? I don't think it makes any sense. And finally, the word communicate means to make common. People forget that, right? That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Here's how you get in touch with me, and we have time for some questions. Yes? Probably shouldn't tell you. I've done a lot of work with big consulting firms. I've also worked as a subcontractor. I think it's become big four now. Uh, short answer is, is yes. But I, in my first book, I had to anonymize companies because I didn't want to spend a lot of time in court. But these, these weren't rinky-dink outfits. In fact, um, many of them were more challenging because of the politics and the jargon. The boutique firms I find in the independents tend to be a lot clearer because they can't afford to lose. They can't have one in 10 clients go bad. They can't afford it. Uh, another question? Yes? I don't do a lot in the book on instant messaging. I put it all under the umbrella. I mean, email is the thing, the biggest purveyor. Yes, a lot of people are using instant messaging, and you could argue that it still suffers from some of the same limitations. It appears to be real time, but it still is asynchronous. You're still losing the, um, the context, the tone. Um, people are just sending more messages. It's, it's one of my uh, complaints against people say, oh, the kids don't read anymore. Nonsense. They're just reading different things. If you tallied all of the blog posts and tweets and uh, Snapchat and WhatsApp messages, I guarantee a kid's probably reading a book every other couple weeks. It's just probably not one of these. So people are reading more. They're sending more messages. But I try in the book not to be the grumpy old guy on the porch with the rocking chair and the shotgun because language has always evolved. Right? There's a great book that I referenced called A Better Pencil by Dennis Barron. No less authority than Plato hated the idea of a book because stories needed to be told. When the typewriter was invented, people couldn't stand it because it was loud and it was impersonal. And if I wrote you a letter, you saw my penmanship. You saw how I wrote. But a typewriter was just the same courier font. So people have always resisted different technologies. Um, I do think that things are changing faster than ever, but things have always been changing. Um, in fact, there's some um, research in the book that I cite about how it took a certain number of years for people to adopt in mass the radio and the telephone and the television and the internet and smartphones. So things are happening really quickly these days. Other questions? OK. Well, thank you for your time. I'll hang out if anyone wants a signed book, if you won one, or a t-shirt or something. But uh, again, thank you for your time.